Welcome again. It's uh, It's been a long day. For, certainly seems to me it's been an intense day. And uh, I, I'd just like to thank everybody who's taken part. You've all contributed actually. And that's been uh, one of the, the fascinating things about today. I, and I really appreciate all the workshop leaders, the people that have done presentations. Thank you for that. We're now going to turn with, this is our, our final act, <laughs> headline act of the day. Um, Carrie is joining us from Los Angeles. I just want to say a, a couple of words. I, I have been involved, I think I first started reading uh, academic material in relation to mediation nearly 20 years ago. And Carrie might be surprised at this, that the first thing of hers that I read was actually a any big book called What's Fair? Yeah, you, you know that one. Um, and, and one of the things that, that I realized when I was reading it was uh, Carrie's particularly good at the questions. <laughs> so watch out for that today. Um, she asks all the best questions. And, and in, in this particular piece, and I think it must have been the, the editorial or first chapter, you, you asked the question, by whose standards should we judge? Uh, which, you know, even back then, I mean, I'm, I'm still studying that actually, <laughs> but it, it, hit, it hit me right, right in, in the head as that seemed to be one of the key questions for those of us in the dispute resolution game, and the mediation game, I should say uh, more widely. Since then, I've read a lot more. I have joked with my class that Carrie writes articles faster than I can read them um, and, and is a very prolific uh, contributor to our field. You, you've seen her a, a, a very shortened bio. Uh, she, she's done a huge amount. Um, we are absolutely delighted that she's been able to join us from, from LA. That, that's amazing. Uh, thanks to <laughs> everything that's happened. We, we've already said it's the best of times and the worst of times, and it's a sobering uh, time to be doing this. However, we are like humans the world over making the most uh, of, of the situation we find ourselves in. So. Uh, it, it's a delight for me, and uh, I'm going to um, invite Carrie to share her, her thoughts with us today. Thank you, Charlie. It's a great, great pleasure to be with all of you. Um, I just said to Charlie, it was 10 years ago um, that I was in Edinburgh at a mediation conference where I may have met some of you out there. Um, <clears throat> and I have a long relationship go, coming to Scotland, so I'm sorry I can't be there in person, um, but this is amazing to be able to do this. Um, and Charlie may not remember this. I think, I don't know how many years ago it was, maybe 15, I think it's when you were at Birkbeck, um, but I was just sitting and having a coffee um, around the corner from where I was living on Gower Street. Do you remember this? And uh, you just popped by and saw me and we started to talk about mediation. And one of the things I love about the UK is big country, but all of us get to know each other more or less um, when we're in the same field. So um, I've been um, coming over to the UK, uh, you know, for longer than I want to admit. Um, and so I feel just a special connection to all of you that are working um, there in this field that I love, um, which I, I love the field and it has many issues. So let me just say um, a few words about how I got into working in, in developing a mediation clinic. Um, and as Sandy's monitoring the questions, I'm happy to take questions as I'm speaking. And so far anyway, I can see the chat. I put the chat up. So Sandy will collect the questions, um, but please feel free to uh, ask questions while I'm talking because we mediators, we like to talk um, and be interactive with people. Um, and I'm sure you've discussed it all day. As you all know, the big issue in the pandemic right now is what happens to mediation um, in these times when we're all doing this electronically now. I start by saying, I was one of the founders of modern mediation work in the United States and also one of the first to have a mediation clinic in the United States. And I am a people to people, face to face person. So I'm happy to talk to you this way um, and I'm happy to take questions on what we all think about the field going um, online and electronic. Um, I have been appearing on a number of programs um, saying where the few places where I think online dispute resolution can work, a few, um, and other places where I think it can't. So let me just start by saying this may help. There's a mantra that we have in the United States, sometimes attributed to our native um, communities, sometimes to Benjamin Franklin, 
Um, and it's the kind of thing that I, as a clinical teacher, refer to all the time. Tell me, and I may forget. Um, show me, and I might remember. Involve me, and I will learn. Um, and the idea here is, uh, for those of us that are teachers, that when people talk and give lectures, uh, people in the audience may or may not listen, they may or may not remember. Um, show to demonstrate um, makes the understanding a little bit deeper, but to actually be involved and to do it makes the learning much richer. Um, my brother's a doctor and they have a equivalent thing in medicine, which is um, see one, do one, teach one, because it's not until you actually try to explain to someone else what you're doing that you might fully understand yourself. So just a couple of words um, about how I got into mediation clinic work. I started as a legal aid lawyer. I don't want to tell you how many years ago, um, long time ago, um, in the 1970s in the United States. Um, and I represented a lot of people, 300 at one time. Sometimes big class action lawsuits in the United States, challenging the conditions of prisons, um, uh, doing class actions on public benefit cases, discrimination cases, and also child custody, divorce, uh, family matters. Um, I specialized ultimately in family matters and employment matters and civil rights. And my, um, my moment of getting into ADR, into dispute resolution was when I realized that we would often win legal cases, um, either on the merits uh, or on legal technicalities or using the United States Constitution as rights protective. So people would win their cases, but the problem wouldn't be solved. And so I began early on in my career as a lawyer to be quite cynical um, in my own way about the legal system. And in the back office of my legal aid office um, was a woman who was two years older than me who sat in the back office and when someone had a problem, she picked up the telephone and she just called directly um, the welfare uh, social worker that was working with somebody, the landlord, um, the employer, and she just tried to work it out. And I tell you this because um, long retired, she ultimately became a judge. Um, this was the inspiration for my whole career because I said there must be a better way to solve problems. And so this was in the mid seventies. And in 1977, I went to become a clinical professor at the law school that I had gone to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia um, to help set up a general clinic for law students to practice law under the supervision of professors. Um, and I did that for quite a while, but I um, kept trying to tell all those people in the clinic that we had to be teaching problem solving negotiation, which was my first bit of scholarship and ultimately mediation. So in 1979, I moved to California um, and I do that because uh, <clears throat> California much more open um, uh, society in a lot of ways. Um, although it was 1979, it was still basically the sixties. Um, and so there was a lot of experimentation um, in music, Charlie, and unfortunately, you know, also in um, drugs and, and politics and lots of things, but it was a very open um, society. And so I took mediation training um, from someone that some of you might've heard of, um, an, a man named Gary Friedman, who was in the Bay, in the San Francisco Bay area, and who very importantly was teaching a particular model um, of mediation, which is what I do as a default position. And that is no caucus mediation. Um, Gary's mediation model was very similar to what I was doing in negotiation. People should be empowered to solve their own problems. Um, and they should only go to a judge or a court when they have to, when they need a ruling, when they need a precedent. But um, the ideal mediation um, was, I'm trying to move the sun out of my face here. Um, the ideal mediation would be uh, for the parties to learn how to negotiate with each other especially for those of you who do family mediation. Um, if people are going to continue to parent after they split up, they're going to have to negotiate all kinds of things. So they can reach an agreement in a mediation about um, custody uh, or about uh, support or whatever, but they're gonna have an ongoing relationship. So my model of problem solving negotiation fit very nicely with Gary Friedman's model 
in which the parties were to be empowered to work on their own problems. And Gary's model was also very deeply psychologically based. He often co-mediated in those years, early years in 1980s with his wife, who was a psychologist. And um, his work was, as we would say, pretty deep in the sense that, again, some of the different models of mediation, it wasn't just to solve the task or resolve the problem, but to work on the party's relationship and to help them communicate. And um, over the years, I began to train with Gary um, and his co-author, um, uh, Jack Himmelstein, in a book, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, the American Bar Association published their book called Challenging Conflict, um, the Understanding Model of Mediation, um, which I think is available online if you haven't seen it. And it, it explains their model, which is, um, Gary was very orthodox, never caucus, ever, never shuttle diplomacy, never separate the parties, always work with them. Um, and together with Jack and Gary, we developed uh, different models of, of empathy training, which was not just for the mediators, but to train the parties in the process to empathize with each other. And lots of um, active listening exercises, as you would do in a training, to be trained to be mediated, but we did it with the parties. So I worked, um, uh, and then I began to take cases. I was a full-time professor, but I began to take some cases privately on the side so I would have mediation experience. And um, uh, Charlie, um, I think just circulated, you know, for me late last night, for you early in the morning, um, a little piece of mine, which you can read if you want to, which is an autobiographical piece uh, that I wrote um, for a, a book that's also just come out that you might find interesting. It's called um, Evolution of a Field, Personal Histories in Conflict Resolution. Um, and that book, um, it's free online actually. After this is over, I can send Charlie the link and he can send it to you so you don't even have to pay for this one. Um, it has um, 23 chapters of some of us that were founders of mediation in the United States, all telling our personal stories. How did we come into this field? So I just told you about my own training. And so in about 1984, 1985, I, I was either the first or second or third person to start a mediation clinic in a law school. Um, Leela Love, who's my co-author on a lot of my textbooks, who's in New York, um, was also one of the first. And the idea was that this field of mediation is so interactive um, and it's impossible to learn without doing it. So um, I started to teach uh, a mediation clinic at UCLA. And the structure was very, and I had to make it up, just like Charlie. I, I read Charlie's uh, wonderful piece uh, on being a pracademic um, that you all have. Um, and like all of us who in the first generation, we were making it up um, as we went along. So my course in the law school was three or four uh, credits. And the students went through um, uh, several weeks of theory and lots and lots of role play and simulation. And before any student got to do an actual real case, <clears throat> I'm trying to move the sun out of my eyes, it's a little better. Um, the, the students um, had to do a full on videotaped mediation that was about one or two hours um, with, um, with real people. So they weren't real cases, but the simulations, we drew on real people in the community who agreed to come in and volunteer um, and to help our students with mediation. And then every student, also had to be in a simulation in which they were a party. Again, the idea experientially inside the mediation was to feel what it was like to be a party and not only to be a mediator. Um, and the other thing that we did in the classroom was this is the mid eighties. So we're beginning to get different models of mediation. And so even though I personally was a no caucus mediator, the students clearly had to be exposed to that because in the United States in commercial mediation, the shuttle diplomacy caucus model was very rapidly becoming the norm. And I can say more about that if you want me to, I will get to that. Um, in addition, I was also a pure facilitative mediator, meaning that the idea, as you just heard me say, was to empower the parties to talk to each other and I tried to teach them to be good problem solvers um, and to brainstorm and to be creative about their own problems. 
But at the same time, in large legal commercial mediations, the mediators were beginning to be much more evaluative. Um, in my view, very problematic, um, moving closer to the arbitration model. Um, I'm also an arbitrator, I do that too, but that's a separate business in different kinds of cases. But I wanted the students to be able to experience all those different models. So the thing I was proudest of in that mediation clinic was we were very lucky in that I had about five to six weeks with the students um, in various models in the classroom with simulations, with role plays, with discussions about different models and different kinds of interventions um, and me demonstrating and them getting a lot of very structured feedback before they actually saw real people. And the other thing I'm proud of that not everybody can do um, and not everybody does do it um, in the United States was when we finally got to real cases, no student mediated without a supervisor somewhere in the room. And this was a model that we had developed in clinical legal education in the United States. Um, when I had students that were trying cases under my supervision, I sat behind them so that they were responsible for doing the questioning in court. Um, and I was only there in case something really terrible happened and I had to move in. And I think I only did that once in 10 years. Um, but I did the same thing in mediation. I sat in the room, um, you know, in the corner. Um, and so in case there was some big problem or, or I had some thought that something should happen, I could slip the student a note. Um, so they were on the front line doing the work, but um, an experienced mediator, I had a co-teacher, um, actually my friend, uh, my best friend in those days who grew up in London, um, and now lives in California. And the, uh, uh, the two of us would alternate being in the room. And I tell you that because most mediation clinics now in the United States do not do that. The students are trained uh, often in an intensive weekend, 40 hours, the kind of classic model, um, uh, a, a mediation training for um, an intense period of time. And then they go off to court or to some other place where they're mediating. Um, and they may not have a supervisor present in the room. And so that's a big issue for me uh, in terms of quality control and you know, standards and who's doing what. Um, and for, for those of you who know it, where I am here in Los Angeles, um, one of the biggest um, mediation programs in our country is at Pepperdine University, which is about 10 miles from where I'm sitting right now, right near the beautiful Pacific Ocean. Um, you should all try to take a summer, summer course there because it's really, when the pandemic's over, it's really a beautiful place. Um, Pepperdine started a mediation clinic around the same time. Uh, and my friend there was not in the room when her students mediated. So she and I would meet and I would tell her I thought that was irresponsible. Um, she's not there anymore. She's a wonderful person. Um, uh, and I don't actually know what they're doing now. But over the years, when I used to give talks um, in California, a lot of the Pepperdine students would come over to me and say, um, I wish I could study with you at UCLA because we're just sort of sent out um, on our own. So Pepperdine was producing a lot of students that were getting certificates in uh, mediation. Um, I think with a lot less, it's better now, um, a lot less um, uh, hands-on supervision. So I feel pretty strongly about that. We can talk about that in the, in the Q&A. Um, uh, and I'm very proud of the fact that I never had a student mediate a case where uh, either I or some other experienced supervisor wasn't in the room. And I tell you that because as I'm sure you've all had those issues, we had some pretty interesting cases. So what did we do? Um, the first thing that happened, we were very lucky. ADR was just becoming a big thing in the mid eighties um, in, in California. So we were approached by the local courts. So we did a lot of landlord tenant cases. And as a, as a legal aid lawyer, I had represented a lot of tenants. So one of the big questions for all of us is, what is the role of law in mediation? And once again, um, I was kind of an outlier. I taught all my students landlord tenant law. And where we are in Los Angeles and Santa Monica is a very highly progressive tenant protective jurisdiction. You wouldn't know that from all the rich movie stars around here, but there's a lot of protection of um, 
uh, warranty of habitability, the conditions of the apartment, and rent control in Santa Monica. So the tenants had a lot of defenses legally to being evicted for non-payment of rent. Um, and they could often counterclaim for bad conditions of their apartment. And uh, one of my other many controversial uh, positions in this field has been that in my view, the law is relevant to what goes on in mediation. So my students mediated knowing what the law was. And the first question we had to consult and confront in class was, if a party in a mediation said, what are my rights and what can I do? Um, if with the goal of mediation to be a neutral, what was the mediator to do? And um, I have written lots, as Charlie says, about my belief that mediators don't just sit there and do nothing, um, that the parties need to know their rights. So very complicated to teach our students how to describe what legal rights were without losing their neutrality. So imagine that, that's like virtuoso uh, performance. Um, I can say this to Charlie the musician. If you were a classical musician, you know, you'd have to do lots and lots and lots and lots of practicing um, and then play off of your um, fellow uh, band uh, participants or the orchestra. Um, and so we would have the students watch us demonstrate and how each of them were treating some of these issues, very complicated stuff. Then we had cases um, where often here in California, the clients only spoke Spanish um, and the courts didn't have enough money then, now they have to, to have translators. But many of our students were bilingual. Another issue, can you be a neutral mediator and also be the translator? Um, and so that was pretty interesting. And some of my students were just fabulous um, at being able to uh, translate the words and also translate the relationship between the parties. So some of them were amazing and I would watch them. Um, uh, I also had um, a couple of students that were Native Americans. And as some of you may know, uh, mediation is a very popular form of dispute resolution in other cultures. And two of my Native American students literally turned out to be um, so good. I mean, just natural from having learned it in their own community that I wanted them to take over and teach the class. Um, they were so much better than I was at listening and reframing and focusing on the relationship of the parties. And also, as some of you may have studied, having a conception of healing circles and restorative justice, which is what I got into a little bit later after this period. So we had, um, we had cases in the local courts, um, ultimately, we did every, we were worked in the court that had all civil litigation matters under $50,000. Um, and so those are pretty major, could be pretty major cases. And there the problem, as some of you may know, was what to do when some people had lawyers and some people didn't. A bigger problem for me wasn't the lawyers, but the repeat players of insurance agents. So they were paralegals or, um, non-lawyers, but very professional at browbeating um, people who had personal injury claims and weren't getting their insurance payments. And so the students and I had to figure out what to do when the students were maybe mediating for the first or second time and are feeling insecure. And a lot of, their, uh, a lot of the plaintiffs or the uh, complainants um, uh, either did, had language issues or um, less power uh, or less money how to deal with power and balance in those situations. Very hard, big issue for our field. But nothing in my view could substitute for experiencing it rather than just talking about it in a class. Um, so, you know, if you wanna hear more, I have, you know, I have a bucket full, I have a lifetime full of stories of how some of these difficult issues came up and then how we, the students, and because I was in the room would then brainstorm and problem solve in the moment. So we would take breaks. If something really complicated happened, we'd take a break and then the students and I would talk about what should we do now? And I'll just quickly tell you one of the most difficult cases for me, this is an ethical one, Charlie, was um, we were mediating a case in which there was an unrepresented elderly man who had been involved, had been standing on a bus when the bus got into an accident with a car. And he fell over and he was hurt and he was in the hospital and, um, and then he tried to sue 
um, the Public Transportation Authority in Los Angeles. And he also tried to find the driver of the car. Um, and I don't know how he did it, but he managed to file some pro se complaints of his own. And he wound up in what was by this time, this would be like the late 1980s, um, early 1990s, what was now becoming mandatory mediation. Any case under 25,000 or so in the civil justice courts had to go to one round of mediation. And our program at UCLA was one of the mediation bodies. And when he came to the mediation, this is so touching. Um, he had watched so much television that he believed when he showed up in our meetings, our, those mediations were in the courthouse, that when he showed up in the courthouse, he would have a lawyer, that some, somehow a lawyer would appear and would help him and would represent him because on television, there were always lawyers in the courtroom. And of course, this was a civil case, not a criminal case. It had been a criminal case. If he were a criminal defendant, he would have had a court appointed lawyer, but not in a civil case. I want to say this is one of the hardest moments I ever had as a mediator because the um, Public Transportation Authority was actually offering him $20,000, which was not bad. He, he had some injuries, but not really terrible. Um, and basically for them, it was um, settling for nuisance value or litigation costs. Um, the cause of the accident was the car driver, not the bus driver. And the car driver in the United States here, believe it or not, was not insured and was himself a poor person. And so there was no money to be gotten from the car driver. So in my view, the Public Transportation Authority was actually being somewhat generous and offering this man something just to be done with the litigation. And, the, and this man couldn't believe that if he, if he said no to the settlement and he showed up in the courtroom you know, a month later, that there would be a court lawyer representing him. Um, and the, you know, my poor student, this was her first case. How is she supposed to deal with this? So this was the only time that I, you know, we, we brainstormed, we took a break, we talked about it. It's the only time that I, as a professor, intervened. Um, and I tell you that because I would just say, when Charlie said, what are the standards? I have a couple of rules in this work. Um, you'll appreciate this, Charlie, improvisation. Never say never and never say always. There are no black letter rules in this work. We are human beings. What we do that I think is better than being a lawyer is we don't just use the tropes, the, the acts, the procedures that everybody else does, we have to adapt to the situation and we have to improvise. And this was the one time I, I sort of stepped out of role and, and, and spent as much time as I could telling this man as much as I could um, that I thought it was a good deal and he should take it because he was in fact not going to get a lawyer if he went to court and he was on his own. But I didn't coerce him. I didn't say you have to do this because it was his decision. And I kept saying that over and over and over again. And ultimately he took the money. I think he was very unhappy. Um, and so I've thought about it. You can hear this now for over 20 years, you know, almost 30 years now, did I do the right thing? Um, and also to realize in a clinic setting that my students participated with me with that, but they actually got to see uh, a mediator in action. So then we also did um, mediations within the university. And I'll just mention that You'll see if you read my um, bio biographical uh, article that Charlie sent you. That was very disturbing because we did some very interesting cases in the university, student to student problems, student to faculty, staff, sexual harassment. Um, we couldn't do union cases, trade union cases because they had their own uh, dispute resolution processes in the collective bargaining agreement. But what happened there was uh, we would have mediations. They would be very successful. Uh, we would, in the sense of reaching an agreement, and then some administrator in the university would refuse to do what somebody in the mediation had agreed to. And so I began to feel a conflict of interest. As a professor within the system, I wanted to denounce these um, administrators who weren't following through on their mediations. Um, and so it's from there um, that I started to get involved in all the ethical issues in mediation. Uh, what is a mediator's role and responsibility for ensuring that an agreement actually is carried through. And does the mediator have any ethical responsibility or not to deal with the people outside of the mediation itself? You know, our, our mantra is volunteerism and the parties are in the room. 
but we all know mediations impact and have effects uh, on other people. And often we need the other people to make the mediation agreements come true. Carrie, can I just interject there? Absolutely. Because I think some of these questions might be pertinent in uh, what you're saying right now. So just to kind of group them up, um, I know you're talking about kind of the evaluate, uh, the evolution and change of mediation and looking forward to like looking at the development. Um, and you've talked about some stories. There was a few questions and I'm just gonna kind of group them together. The first was like, someone said you are, uh, Alistair said you are concerned um, that the concepts of voluntariness is evaporating and um, that the lack of personal contact is increasing um, with online me mediations. And his question is that, should this whole process of professionalism be reversed or is it too late to go back to the golden age of mediation? And I just wanna group a few things again together um, about people, cause you talked about the community, the natural community uh, mediators. And there's a kind of a few questions around mediators seeming professional if they're not lawyers so if we could maybe touch on that that would be great okay, okay. so wonderful um uh, quickly um i think i my, i think that uh, non-lawyers can absolutely be mediators many of them are much better um depending on on their uh communities they come from and also their professional training um, so I, I think there's definitely roles for non-lawyers to do this work, but, and, um, as we say in Gestalt psychology, it's better to say and rather than but, um, uh, there are some cases that lawyer mediators are necessary. I, I've done, um, after this period that I'm describing to you as a mediation um, clinician, I've done a lot of very big class action commercial cases where the law um, is more complicated. And in those kinds of cases, um, I think it is necessary to be a lawyer, just mostly because when, when there are lawyers with the parties in a more complex media mediation, um, the lawyers manipulate the mediators. Um, so I'll just tell you, fast forward a little bit, when I moved back to the East Coast to teach at Georgetown, which is in Washington, I became a mediator in the Court of Appeals, which is the court, federal court just below the Supreme Court. So lots of very big cases, federal agency cases, legal cases. And in those cases, the lawyers representing both the parties and the federal government could be quite manipulative um, in how they use the process. So in those kinds of cases, um, I think you need to be a lawyer just to know when they're playing you is what I would say. I mean, I did some legal interventions of various kinds in those kinds of cases. That, that is a segue into the golden age question. I think the golden age is over. I really do uh, for a number of reasons. Some of them are good reasons because as I see in some of the chat, um, many um, state courts in the United States and the federal system now requires parties to go to mediation or some form of ADR before they can even get into the courtroom. And actually, I think it's a good thing. I really do. Um, I will tell you that in the 1990s, I started to mediate um, um, through a, uh, formal body are asbestos cases, which were cases involving literally billions of dollars, Lloyd's of London, billions of dollars of insurance with a lot of lawyers and a lot of parties and a lot of hurt people who got mesothelioma and bad lung cancer from asbestos. And in those cases, the parties had to go to mediation before they could litigate. And it turned out to be an amazingly positive thing. I used to speak about this all the time. These very hostile, aggressive um, uh, litigators were forced into mediation. And this is pretty interesting because you can see, I'm, I'm an old lady now, but I've always mediated with long hair. And a lot of these guys, certainly in the 1980s, didn't take me very seriously. They thought I was you know, some young girl or something like that, or a social worker. They were very, and so I would do these mediations in these fancy hotels. Um, and they thought they would just, you know, show up for 10 minutes and then go away. And all of you have had this experience. We had this incredible moments of magical mediation where these tough guys, insurance lawyers, um, big company lawyers would suddenly see that this was a more productive way to do things than to argue in court. And so I became an advocate of mandatory mediation. Um, not, you know, mandatory mediation is an oxymoron 
in the golden age. You only go to mediation if you want to, if it's voluntary. But um, uh, mediation, making someone at least try it as a, uh, was a way to educate about it. So I've given up on the, it has to be voluntary. Um, uh, and that's the teacher in me, you know, bring me your, uh, bring me your skeptics, bring, your, bring me your cynics and I will try to work with them. And I wanted the students to see that. So um, I'm mindful of the time and I know you want me to um, stop yap yapping so you can ask questions. But let me say this, uh, in the mediation clinic context, um, for all these things I'm answering, I think um, that it should not only, not only be not voluntary for the parties, but in my ideal world, there wouldn't be a law student, a social work student, a psychology student that didn't have to take a mediation course. Um, now, you know, we can talk about whether we've got enough room for all of them to have clinical experiences, but this is such an important human skill uh, to be able to problem solve, to listen, to be empathetic, um, and to try to work things out uh, before going to somebody else, you know, and do it participatorily and in that sense voluntarily. That um, I, I just don't understand why this hasn't become mandatory in education. And as some of you know, it is in schools now. We teach we teach kids to use their words, um, and young children in um, before the pandemic anyway, young children in early education are supposed to be learning this stuff. And I just want to say many, many countries are way ahead. You guys can tell me what's going on in Scotland and the UK and elsewhere. I realize I see some people are from all over the world in this program. That's great. Um, I taught two years ago in Belgium, which has come to the mediation uh, party a little bit late, but it's sometimes good to come later because they've recently passed legislation um, making it non-voluntary, saying that people have to go to mediation in certain kinds of cases. and their legal master's program now requires every student to take a negotiation or mediation course. And so I lectured in this huge class of 500 master's students at the University of Leuven in Leuven, Belgium, where they all had to learn some of this. Now, some of them are very cynical and they don't believe it or they think they're gonna go off and do what they do anyway. But um, an amazing number of students just loved it and thought this was a better way to be. And then I taught, um, a mediation course in the master's program. Um, and there the challenge is to give all the students in such big programs some kind of clinical experience, because I think it is important to interact with real people and not do it only in role plays and simulations. Um, so they're still working all of that out. At the moment, those big courses are mostly simulation, but also the students then get placements where they're supposed to work with other mediators um, and at least see some, even if they don't get to do them. Um, and as many of you know, the arbitration field, at least in the United States, has always been based on apprenticing. One can't just say, hello, I think I'm gonna be an arbitrator. Um, the only way to get, and I see in the chat, someone has asked about the, the club of mediators and arbitrators, and absolutely, it, it has become a club, that's a problem. Um, but the arbitrators have always been a club. That is, you don't get into it unless you have been attached to someone um, who takes you with them. You hold their bags, as we say in law. You, you're a bag holder um, until, and you get to watch. You watch many, many, many of them before you get to do them. Um, and um, there's a big worry that mediation is moving to that. Um, as, as so I can see in the chat, some people who do have master's, pro, have master's degrees from some of our programs in the United States thinking that the degree will be an entree into some of these cases, and it's not. Um, so um, it, it is a problem. The field, it, it is no golden age. Um, I was very lucky, right? I was there at the beginning. So I just started doing it, a lot of skepticism, but pretty soon I had a lot of experience. And so then I would get chosen by people that had heard me, or I would work in a program in court or make my own program in the law school. Um, so for those of us that develop clinics, we develop our reputation and we bring the cases in and that reputation follows. So I do feel for all of you out there, some of you who've re recently gotten degrees and trying to get into the field, how do we do this? Here's some good news, okay? So again, pandemic weird news. Um, I know this is true in the UK too. Um, a lot of our courts closed down for a while. And what do you know? 
business started booming, at least in a certain class of cases, right? People who could pay mediators. That's good news for those of you who want to make a living. The mediators who actually are not volunteer mediators in court systems, but paid mediators, all of a sudden, it took a while. It was sort of quiet for about three or four weeks. And then um, business started booming. And so some of the mid-career mediators are saying they now have more business than they ever had. And some of us think people will never go back to court. So there's a kind of interesting new opportunity in this. Um, and believe it or not, um, the mediation clinics, and Charlie will hear about this on Monday from Pepperdine, um, have, have, are teaching students how to mediate on Zoom. Um, and I will say this, this is where I'm an old lady, you know, um, a golden age, gray hair, I'm gonna be out of business soon. The younger mediators or the newer mediators, I didn't say younger, the newer mediators have more repertoire than I do because they are willing to evaluate, because they are willing to caucus. I mean, Zoom is, by the way, you might be interested in this for those of you who are on Zoom. The, um, the breakout room function on Zoom, I don't know how many of you have used that. That was put there because of Colin Rule, who's a mediator who developed the online dispute resolution system for eBay. That's what Colin did. Colin was in Silicon Valley when all of this technology was being developed. He's a big tech guy. And the breakout function, which nobody was using in pre-pandemic ages much, some teachers used it. The breakout function is there in, in Zoom to go to breakout rooms um, because mediators wanted it. Um, and so Zoom is now, and so are the other platforms, Microsoft Teams and others that I'm completely unfamiliar with, um, are adapting to the needs of our field. And as Charlie will learn, a lot of mediation clinical teachers in the United States have totally revamped their teaching so that students have to learn how to mediate and they also have to learn the technology and when to use it. Um, so for those of you worried about the club, this is one of those times when the youngins and the newbies are gonna take over from me um, and the oldies because um, many of the I, I'm in a group here in the United States called the Senior Mediators, self-appointed. Um, those of us who think we are the founders of, of the field, we go off on a retreat once a year, uh, about 30 of us, and sort of talk about the state of the field. And I was one of the younger ones in that group when it started. So um, unfortunately, we've actually lost a lot of people, um, only one to COVID, but, but to death. Um, and um, we're, we're starting to invite some younger people to join us because um, the field is changing. So, um, I, you know, the golden age was wonderful, but um, my, my, inform my answer to your question is um, it's over. Um, and the good news, I want, I, I'm gonna stop so we can do questions. The good news for you guys is that for those of you who are coming into the field, it's yours. Um, it's yours to create, it's yours to change. Um, and it's going to be hard for if any of you are clinic, clinic runners in your, in, in wherever you are with courts, with universities, you're going to have to learn to do new things. Um, I had to learn how to teach on Zoom. I've mastered that one, sort of. Um, but doing mediation um, electronically, I think, is here to stay. Um, and, 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 and so it is transformative. I'm not going as far as Richard Suskind. I do not think it's the end of lawyers. I do not think that online is taking over everything. I'm happy to debate him at any time. Um, um, I'm still a face-to-face -face girl, um, but I do think um, that there's, there's a lot of room for change and growth. Thanks, Kerry. I think so, that um, since we're on the subject about kind of students and new people coming into mediation, it might be pertinent just to ask this question. So how important is it to find out after mediation whether or not mediation settlements have agreed or worked with your students? Um, and I suppose that goes to uh, also equal to the kind of topic of these short courses of mediation that are now running and then after 40 hours you're a mediator so potentially it would be good to hear your thoughts around that and where that might develop into competent mediators that are natural in this field. Great question so um, I'll take them in reverse. So, the, um, so this is um, this comes from opera and music also the favorite kind of training I ever did in my life was to do master classes 
Um, a wonderful person in the senior mediators group, unfortunately now deceased, Margaret Shaw um, died suddenly of a heart attack. She was a master mediator and she and I used to do trainings of master classes. That is we'd have mediators in the audience. We'd take the same case and then she and I would demonstrate different models. And then we would stop action. You know, this is what uh, performers do. Uh, and psychologists, it's a standard way to train psychologists. So we do a segment of performance, we'd stop, we'd get feedback from the audience and then fishbowl technique for those of you who use it, we'd have someone in the audience swim into the fishbowl and to then practice either what we had done or to do some variation on their own. I can't stand 40 hour short courses, okay? I'll just be very public about that. I know we're recording this. Um, I think they're not enough. It's a good place to get started. And nobody in my view should get a certificate to do anything after 40 hours. Um, Margaret, say Margaret, Margaret Shaw and I were trainers for the federal courts in the United States for many years. And so everyone was invited into a 40 hour, two weekend, two weekend course with simulations. And then what they didn't know, probably not unethical, but you know, the trainers, we would watch them in their simulations and we would quietly grade them, you know, one to five. And the court would only put them on the roster if they got a five from Margaret and I. And we had test validation. So, you know, she and I would compare and people got many of these scores over the two weekends. And then if they got a five and they got put on the roster, then they would have to um, apprentice for a little bit and go to, go, I think we made them go to five mediations just to watch, you know, see one, be taught, see one. And then they would have to watch five before they could do one on their own. Um, mindful of the chat, yes, it became a club. It became very prestigious to be on the court roster of a federal mediation program. I now do some training here for the federal program in Los Angeles at the trial level. Um, but these were a very serious training programs and I believe in them. So um, I am very skeptical of the short course um, and I see all the time. I mean, I just, um, you can tell I could go on for hours and I'm gonna stop soon. This, the Los Angeles Times yesterday had a full page ad. It must've cost some guy $10,000 to put in an ad to say, come to the National Conflict Resolution Association and I'll mediate your case. Now I've been in this field for 40 years, never heard of this person, right? Um, no formal training that I can see. I can't even tell what the, um, the field is, whether he's a lawyer or not. And so there's no regulation here. Anybody, anybody can do it. Um, so in my view, you know, that's really terrible. Back to the first question, Sandy. Um, for any of you that are doing any research, I think the leading issue for me in the field is for someone to go find out what happens after mediations are over. Um, I did a mediation uh, 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 in Washington about, well, 10 something, 10 years ago. Um, during the Iraq war, um, you know, you guys were there with us. The United States went over and hired a lot of private companies, horrible companies that, that did, um, you know, not only some of the killing in the war, but provided a lot of the infrastructure. So Halliburton, which was a very big engineering company, um, our former vice president, uh, Cheney was the CEO at the time. Um, and they hired a lot of Americans to go over there and they got paid a lot of money. So to make a long story short, Halliburton had a very good internal dispute resolution system. And a man who was a black engineer um, used their system to complain about discrimination that he suffered when he was in Iraq um, in terms of pay and conditions of employment. And I mediated that case and the, um, Human Resources, the HR person who came to the mediation signed a very good mediation agreement. And four months later, the man and his wife called me and said, they haven't done any of the things they said they were going to, what can we do? And all I could do was refer them, I couldn't do it obviously, to some lawyers to sue the company. And of course, what the company said was, well, we agreed to that mediation, but all of that activity took place in Iraq. So it has nothing to do with the United States. So again, legal issue. Can you enforce a mediation signed in the United States? Answer, yes, you can. Um, on the basis of actions that happened in Iraq? Yes, you can, because there's some law that says our employment discrimination law applies abroad under certain circumstances, but you need it to be. So um, I believe he never got his relief. Um, and it's been a pet peeve of mine um, that 
it's been very hard for us to find out whether mediations have actually worked. So for those of you in clinics, it would be an interesting project, some of you may be doing it, to have the students follow up on cases six months later, two months later as a project. Oops, it's close to 8.55. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we have, go ahead, Sandy. Yeah, well, we will have to wrap up at this point. Just there are natural questions around the lawyers, mediators, the ethics around mediation, um, how students can enter and be trained really fully and immersely into this program. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to answer all them questions now. And I'm sure as time went would go on, there would be more questions. Um, but thank you very much and apologies if we couldn't answer all your questions and um, I'll hand over to Charlie, is it? Um, I'll just say awesome. before Charlie sure. says bye, um, you guys can find me online um, and I'm happy if you, if I didn't answer your question, shoot me an email um, and I'll do my best to answer on email. Thanks, that's very kind of you. <laughs> um, and so thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie. Uh, if you're, I spotlighted Carrie there and I've removed the spotlight. Uh, so you might find you're now on speaker view, which means you probably just see me, uh, but you can go back to gallery view if you want and, and see all four, three of us. I'm really wrapping up for the day. Uh, I, I have to say a huge thanks to, to Carrie, of course, for, for speaking across the ocean, uh, even though she hasn't had to travel it. And that, insight. I mean, it came at the end of a day when I think we were wrestling with the same questions that, that you've been talking about. And um, particularly, I mean, not just the practical questions. I think there, there are issues. I talked at the start of the day about the apprenticeship of identity. And actually, you've, you've touched on that quite a lot. It's not just how do you do it? It's how do, how do you become it? How, how do you be? Uh, and so, I think that's wrapped up quite quite well in it, and it's bookended this this sense that a mediation clinic is an ambitious project for any of us. I, I'm very keenly aware of it. Uh, I'm sure others are, but it's a really really exciting project, and and you don't know what it's going to generate. Um, it, it clearly is generating a credibility, and it's clearly generating a a sense of. Uh, people observing and saying this is working you know the, these students are good these students know what they're doing they're ready um, and certainly from the point of view of, of my own students I, that idea of building your cv of, of being able to say to somebody i've done 10 mediations it's a very different thing from saying i've done one um, or if i've done 100 it's, it's, so i think for all of these reasons i'm excited about it um, i think we have Carrie, you, you've uh, done me proud. You, you've raised more questions than answers, but you know that's, I think, partly the nature of, of mediators uh, congenitally, and partly the nature of the topic. We've got tons to go away with, and um, I do want to say just a couple of thank yous at the at the end of the day. We we must thank all of our contributors, the people who took the workshops. I, I dipped into all of them. Thank you so much for your time and your, your energy and answering questions and, and going through what you're doing. Um, thank you to, particular thank you to the, the committee that organized this, um, Pauline and Sandy and Sophie and Bill and Elan. Thanks all of you. You know you've, you've put extra, extra work into this to make it work. Um, I'm quite pleased with Zoom. It, it, it's not been bad today. I didn't know that about the breakout rooms, but uh, Colin Rule has has done us all a service because it's become a, a kind of great part of, of how I, I go about my life. Um, so thank you to, to the committee. And of course, thank you to everybody who participated today. We had no idea uh, how many we could come. I see we, we have 65 people on the screen at the moment. And I think that's really extraordinary. We, we certainly would never have expected that number to come to Glasgow. I think it tells us something. So I think with that, I, uh, I just need to wrap up actually. I need to thank everybody and express my appreciation and gratitude for you all. And I think we will we'll actually finish two minutes early according to my my little clock. Um, so cheerio, have a have a enjoy thank the rest you. of your day and carry enjoy the rest of your much longer thank day. Thank you to everybody. Stay safe, everyone.